is important in the kingdom of God. Amen? <clears throat> so, in Luke 12, 32, do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God wants to give you righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. How many believe we must believe that God is good? And he rewards those who seek him diligently. Jesus said this in the book of John 15. And this man ought to know because he walked with Christ. He was called the beloved by Jesus himself. He says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey me, you remain in my love just as I obey my Father and remain in his love. I have told you this so that you will be filled with my what? Joy. Joy follows obedience in God's will. Yes, your joy will overflow. And those words come from Jesus. John recorded those. How many have ever heard of an author named Dallas Willard? Dallas Willard, he's a fairly famous author, but Dallas Willard was actually raised, he was a Missouri boy. He was raised in southern Missouri. Uh, we'll go back a few years. It's probably around mid, early to mid-50s. My mother was raised in Davisville. Anybody ever been to Davisville? What's the other name for Davisville? Pucky Hell, there's a local right there who knows. Can you spell Pucky the right way? Okay. I'll, I'll just quote you what Dallas had wrote, a little section of his book. He says, as a child, <clears throat> I lived in an area of southern Missouri where electricity was available only in the form of lightning. Okay. Electricity came to Davisville in 1952. Anybody remember that? There are probably a few maybe left here. In my senior year of high school, he says, the REA, Rural Electric Administration, admitted or extended its lines into the area where we lived. And electrical power became available to households and farms. When those lines came by our farm, a very different way of living presented itself. Our relationships to fundamental aspects of life, meaning daylight and dark, hot, cold, clean, dirty, work and leisure, preparing food and preserving it, could then be vastly changed for the better. If you've lived that, you know exactly what he means. But we still had to believe in electricity and its arrangements, understand them, and then take the practical steps involved in relying on it. You may think the comparison rather crude, and in some respects it is, but it will help us to understand Jesus' basic message about the kingdom of heaven if we pause to reflect on those farmers who, in effect, heard the message, repent, for electricity is at hand. Turn from your kerosene lamps and lanterns, your ice boxes and cellars, your scrub boards and rug beaters, your foot-powered sewing machines, and your radio with dry cell batteries. The power that can make your life better was right there near where they were. You simply had to make arrangements for it, then you could utilize the electric. He says, strangely, few did not accept it. They didn't want the power. They did not enter the kingdom of electricity. Some just didn't want to change. Others said they couldn't afford it, or so they thought. Now, in those days, electric was fairly cheap compared to what it is today. But to be sure, God's kingdom has been there as long as we humans have been here, even longer. But it's been available through us or to us through simple confidence in Christ Jesus our Lord, who is the anointed one, who only from the time he became a public figure. Do you know and believe the love that Christ has for you? Do you? Do you know and believe that God has a great love for you? Here's what we should do. Meditate on the cross. That doesn't mean we're always thinking about death per se, but what the cross represents to the believer. Does everyone in the room know what the cross represents to you? It represents the price that was paid for your soul, the eternal portion of your soul, from now till it never ends. Amen? To now all eternity. So let's look at the kingdom. Let me ask you first, what is not the kingdom? What's not the kingdom? Well, a man is not necessarily a Christian because he or she abstains from certain things. Did you know Muslims abstain from alcohol, but they're not Christian? Muslims do not believe in, quote, gay marriage, but they're not Christians. You and I cannot say that a believer or a man or woman is not a Christian because they do certain things, 
because the long list of sins that believers are told to relinquish actually proves that it's possible to truly be saved yet still be in the infant stage of the Christian life. How many know when you're born again that means you're a babe in Christ? Do babes know everything? No. I'm talking about little babes. Babies. They don't know everything. They have to be what? Taught, trained, amen? School in the things of life. Guess what? We believers have to do the same thing. So we consider touch only the service, okay? And it's there what we must understand what the text is saying to us. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not built upon what you eat or what you drink necessarily. The citizenship of a child of the kingdom is not necessarily determined by the external acts in which one participates or from which one abstains. Those things will follow. James said it this, you all talk about your faith, but I will show you my faith by the works that I do. But the salvation came first. Amen? So again, it's verse 17. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So the kingdom of God is actually about experiencing the presence of the king. Presence of God. Amen? Uh, Psalm 1611. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. David understood what the presence of God meant. He understood being out in the sheepfold, out in the, out in the pastures with he and the sheep. David understood what the presence of God meant. He played his harp skillfully, the Bible says. That means he picked it up day and night. You don't play skillfully the first time, correct? Many people take lessons. I'm not sure he got lessons, but when he played God began to bless him. He began to play skillfully because he played and he played and he played. But he was playing for the audience of one. How many go around the house singing or whistling all by yourself? Anybody? Tell on your spouse. Do, does any of your spouses do that? You know what? Usually that's a sign of joy. It's something, something's good about that day. Something's good in your heart. You're whistling while you work. Amen? Some people are annoyed by whistlers, but you know what? It's okay. You have a joy in your heart when you sing or whistle to yourself. Amen? The very first characteristic that we we're, we're find listed here is that of righteousness. God's way of doing things. God's right way of doing things. We just come out of the Ten Commandments. That's actually God's right way of living. With Him and with one another. Amen? How many are living with one another in a right manner? Well, we'll have to find that out, won't we? We'll, we'll ask somebody around you who lives with you, right? If we were to take a poll within your house, would it be the same poll that people would answer in the church house? May not be, may it, right? But usually those who, who are around you all the time know who you really are, amen? But you know what? God knows who you really are. 24-7, day in, day out, at night, no matter who's around, God knows who we are. But here in Righteousness, it's important to note that the sequence of these characteristics of the kingdom of God in the heart. Righteousness is listed first. Then we find uh, peace. Then we find joy. In Matthew 6, Jesus says this, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. One reason there's a, there's a frustration of mankind is that peace and joy are sought without righteousness they get them mixed up in the order it's kind of like remember remember jesus if you want to follow me deny yourself take up your cross then follow me that's a pattern but if you're trying to do the second thing before the first thing it doesn't work you can't take up your cross then it becomes religious and becomes legal and then it becomes damning there's no joy but if you deny yourself then take up your cross you can follow Christ. It works so much better that way because your flesh cannot be leading the way. How many know that? Anybody ever found that in your life? Your flesh cannot be God. There can only be one Lord of your life. Amen? So, <clears throat> without the peace of God, there can be no joy. Can you imagine a man who's been in an automobile accident? His leg is twisted out of its socket. The bone is broken. Can you feel it? He tells the doctor, hey, doc, just give me some sedative quickly so I can be at peace and rest. I just want to sleep. Just give me that drug. Go away and leave me. Think about that. How crazy would that be? 
I don't think anybody in their right mind would say such a thing, and yet millions of people seek for an opiate of peace without righteousness. See, the doctor must set the fracture, put the leg back in its socket, God's nature begins to take its course, and that person will now understand and feel healing and peace. Now, it certainly stands the reason in the sequence of God dealings with man, God simply will not allow a person to know true peace until that person first possesses divine righteousness, God's way of doing things. This goes back a few years, but um, there was a butcher one time. You've heard the stories about the butcher and his son. Well, this butcher was once asked what the difference it made to him when Christ entered his life. Because when Christ enters a life, there's always a difference. This is what he replied. He said, I stopped weighing my thumb. He then told how before becoming a Christian, he would put meat on the scales in such a way that his thumb would trail down, and it was approximately the weight of one ounce. He included that thumb in the weight of all the beef, the pork, and every other item of his merchandise. But after Christ came into his life, into his heart, he said, I stood away from the scales. I gave a full 16 ounces of meat. And when he served customers who he had formerly cheated, he added an ounce to make up for the past offenses. Sounds like Zacchaeus done. I'll repay how many times after what I've stolen to those I've ripped off. See, the kingdom of God produces integrity in a believer. The world as I've said from this poem before, because only they're watching my life. They're watching your life, believer. They may not tell you on a daily basis, but it's amazing what people notice and record mentally about your life, your circle, your influence. Amen? Even how they look at you at the gas station, in the grocery store, or Maybe you work around people five days a week, eight or 40 hours a week. Some of you are around those people more than you're around your own family. What do they record in their minds about our life? Integrity is so important. See, in Psalm 15, 2, it says, He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth from his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his friend, nor takes up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and doesn't change, who doesn't put out his money, usually meaning an overblown uh, amount of interest, and doesn't take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Anything could come into your life and against you. And guess what? How many have lived life long enough, stuff comes against you? You have felt the winds of trial and tribulation. Jesus himself says you will have these things in your life. But if you'll hold on, plant yourself, amen, in the righteousness of God, you will have the righteousness, the peace, the joy that you've been looking for. The second characteristic, peace. How many love peace? We hear that word across the world. As a matter of fact, we do live in the last days. I would say we're more in the last minutes of the last days. And one of the scriptures we find about the last days is peace, peace, then sudden destruction. It's talking about the peace treaty that will come with Israel, and the Antichrist will make that during that seven-year tribulation time. Have you been seeing anything on the news about Israel? Do you find it interesting that Israel will be in the news in this day? Okay, this tells you Make sure your heart is prepared. The Lord is coming. We do not know the day or hour. Only the Father knows. Matter of fact, Satan doesn't know the day or hour. But Satan sure knows the season also. And he's unloading his arsenal against the body of Christ, against the world. He's mounting for himself an army, amen, to get back at God because he hates God. If he hates God, he hates God's people. So he hates you. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy your life, your family's life, amen. But greater is he that's in us that's in the world amen so we have we'll have at our arsenal the things are not the flesh but they're mighty through the pulling down of strongholds so we have no excuse amen we have everything at our disposal to win this battle against you know who so when a man possesses the righteousness of god through christ they live in such a way that 
men and women see that righteousness, they glorify God the Father who's in heaven, that's according to Scripture, and that man will dwell in God's peace. That man, that woman, that child will dwell in the peace of God. Peace is the second characteristic, the second mark of a citizenship in the spiritual kingdom of our God. Now, this is actually not peace with God, but it's peace of God. Difference. Peace with God will be similar to the peace that exists between nations after a war. And quite often that doesn't last, does it? See, we were at enmity with God, but Christ made peace, how? By the blood through the cross, according to Colossians 1. This peace we get by coming to him. He said, come unto me, all of you who are weary, I will give you rest. But the peace of God, the second rest in that passage says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. I've not met a human being on the planet who does not need rest just like I do in my soul. Everyone needs rest in their soul. So we've been justified by faith so that we become the righteousness of God. Okay? The believer finds a rest that cannot even be described. Philippians 4, 7 says, God himself said that it's a peace that passes all understanding. Has anybody ever come against a problem that you just can't figure out? It goes beyond your understanding? Huh? You can't figure it out. It's no way. You have a lid. How many have a lid here? This is where your lid is. You're not going any higher where your lid's at. Amen? It can't go any higher because the lid is there. In our understanding... We have lids. That's as high as it goes. Amen? So what do you do after that? You trust God. You put your trust in Him. How many know it's, it's possible to have a sanctuary in your heart that's actually completely soundproof? Let me ask, anybody, anybody here get Christmas presents this year? Nobody did. You all been bad. You got coal, I guess, right? How many, how many own a pair of these noise-canceling headphones? Anybody? Now, men, I saw a lot of men have their hands up. What's that say? Did you raise your hand, Marty? Yes? Okay. He... Noise-canceling headphones. They actually work. I own a pair. I only wear them when I'm away somewhere, but they actually work. I took those one morning, and I was, I was playing a video and uh, studying my word at, uh, at the hotel, and I put those on because I got up early and I didn't want to wake my wife up, and, and she gets up, and it's kind of still dark, and I have the little light from the laptop screen, and, and somebody's talking, but I didn't know she was saying anything, so finally she gets in my light, and it kind of startled me. I couldn't hear her. All I could hear was what was, everything else was kind of shut off. How many know that there's a place inside of here that you can get that the ants or the outside world cannot penetrate that soundproof room. When we were flying to Israel uh, back in 011, one of the things I really noticed, I think it was about 4 o'clock in the morning, and I was awake, and it's hard to sleep on those planes, especially when you're inside and you're long-legged and they got you cramped up like a tuna. But we were flying into Tel Aviv, and I could see there were many Jewish people on, but there were rabbis on, you know, the Orthodox. And he had the curly cues. But at 4 o'clock in the morning, where you're able to get up, move around, you know what they were doing? They were tabernacling with God. They took their prayer shawl, throw it over, okay? They're walking up and down the aisle, over the large plane, one of the big ones. They're over on the right aisle. They're walking back and forth, doing their, doing their thing. They got the prayer shawl. They're tabernacling with God. I mean, we got a plane full of people. I don't know, 300-some people on the plane. It's a tube, that's flying 800 miles an hour over the Atlantic Ocean. You know what he's doing? He found his solitude and his sanctuary with God in the midst of 300-some people at, at what, 20,000, 30,000 feet in the, in the air, and he's tabernacling with God. He found his sanctuary, and there's a place within us. We find that sanctuary within our heart that can be soundproof. It's a retreat with God to be refreshed and restrengthened to, you know what? To return back to the conflict of life. When that rabbi got off that plane, guess where he was going? Probably Jerusalem, maybe Tel Aviv. But he's going back to battle. How many go home at night and it's your sanctuary? Anybody homeless here tonight or today? 
If you are, talk to us. But if you're not, I assume everybody in the place has a home. You call home. It's your sanctuary. And you go there. And you find respite. You find rest. How many have a chair? Or a couch? How many have your own bed? A place where you rest and you find that peace and that solitude in your life. It's your haven, right? And you'll actually guard that place, correct? Some of you guard it very well. Some of you have alarms. Some of you have numbered weapons, AR-15, 9 millimeters, and, and so you've got everything to protect your haven. Well, this is the haven of the heart. It's a haven that God wants to be a heavenly place. It's a place where God already counts us as seated with Christ, sharing his throne and his priesthood, according to Ephesians 2. Our life is a constant shifting it's a scene from conflict to the haven of peace, from the haven of peace, and back to the conflict on a daily basis. Jesus said in John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The in and out. We go into the haven of peace and power. We go out to the conflict, the daily vine, in his peace and in his power. We feed in the pasture. We go forth refreshed to live as the citizens of heaven. He's called us to live in the midst of the conflict. Wherever you go today, you've got, you've got conflict. Sometimes you walk in the church, you've got conflict. One of the great needs of the church today is a fresh baptism in righteousness, peace, and the third characteristic, joy. Now, I've heard the acronym J-O-I, Jesus, others, and yourself. That's a good acronym, Jesus then others, and then who? Then yourself. It's all about denying yourself and taking up your, your cross. Why, does the, why would the enemy want to steal your joy? Why does he want to steal your joy? What's with this guy wants to take my joy? I mean, is anything against me just being happy? Well, the joy of the Lord is our strength, according to Nehemiah. If he steals our joy, he saps our strength, he renders us ineffective. So joy is key. Listen to who wrote this. Job in 821. He will fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. That come from the book of Job. Okay? 650 times in the scriptures you have in your hand, you find joy, rejoice, rejoicing, glad, gladness, or delight. Isaiah 12, 3 says, the prophet says to draw out water from the wells of salvation with joy. Our salvation should bring us such joy to start with. Matthew 25, 21, heaven is called the joy of the Lord. Acts 13, 52, the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, and so on. So what is joy? We find in the Old Testament, joy is dance, leap or spin around in pleasure. When's the last time somebody exhibited Old Testament joy? You might do that in your kitchen this morning. <laughs> yes, somebody did yesterday. That's what it actually means. How do we experience the kingdom of God's joy? Well, number one, in order, is righteousness. See, righteousness is right standing with God. I'm not talking about being happy, okay? Happy. Because happiness fades. You'll have happy days, right, Fonzie? You'll have happy days. Hey, you'll have happy nights, happy moments. You'll also have sad moments. You know, I think of these people who are walking through the death of their loved one. It's really been quite a last few weeks with the passing of people or the, or the diagnosis of cancer and such. It really it grieves my heart because I understand what families walk through. It's a tough day. It's hard, isn't it? And uh, an accident recently of someone that took a life, it just it made my heart grieve for the family. But you know something? In the midst of the worst tragedy in life, joy does not get erased. Joy does not cease to exist. Amen? And when you and I as believers are in right standing with God, and number two, 
and peace. Guess what peace really represents? Your peace with God if you're living righteously, amen? But peace really is our standing with others. How many are in right standing with one another? This is where most of our conflict comes from. It's not so much bad standing in God, although there's plenty of that, but the conflict here plays out because of a misunderstanding or not standing in right standing with our neighbors and our friends and, as you found out after Christmas, our families. But that should not be, should it? Let me give you a little personal testimony. We, we went last night to a Saint, actually it's Cottleville, St. Saint Charles, St. Peter, it's all a conglomerate up there. And uh, they've all got Chick-fil-A's, Home Depot's, and lots of gas stations. Deerbergs and Schnooks. And we went to Jacob's fiance's, Megan's family's place. And there's eight children, several grandkids, in-laws. We walked in and I met, I met uh, Megan's dad and mom. And we met her mom before and got to meet all the family. And, and uh, they decided, somebody was at Marlene, somebody decided, one of the older sisters says, you know what, let's wear name tags. So everybody gets a name tag. So all the little ones will run up name tags on. And there's Leah, there's John, there's and I don't know if they put one on us or not, but, but I mean, we're the one that stood out, right? We're the ugly stepchildren in the midst of this beautiful family. And uh, at least I was, not my wife. But it was, you know what I noticed about the house? It was full of joy. There were kids running everywhere. They were talking. One time they were crying. I think one of them slammed one's head in the stove or something like that happened in there. We heard crying. Ah, no big deal. They went in and patched it up and back to joy. And, but what really stood out was a large family, but it was, there was joy in the house. We were invited to sit down and have a meal together. We had a wonderful Italian meal last night by a German and a Lithuanian who made wonderful Italian food. God bless those. But the joy was beautiful, and really it's because of this. They trust in God. This couple met years ago in northern Chicago in a German neighborhood. There's a German district, a language district of the Assemblies of God. Those two met there. Out of that has come all of these kids in the last 40 years and grandkids and the joy and the peace that we felt there. And they're, uh, when I can tell, they're living their lives, George and Marina, living their lives righteously before their children, before the, the lives of those around them. So hear me. When righteousness strikes deep into our being, it enters the sanctuary in here where peace dwells. It springs forth a joy like a flood. How many, how many have been involved in a flood? Floods do a thing of like sweeping stuff. They just take over, don't they? Joy is the first outward mark of the presence of Christ in a man or a woman. Joy. If a believer is not joyful, it's almost certain they don't possess the peace of God. I didn't say happy, I said joyful, okay? Joy mustn't be confused with just mirth or happiness, okay? Joy is a steady of our being. When all is chaos going around, how many have ever experienced chaos in your life? Chaos. But there's deep down, there's this joy, there's this knowing. And, and how many know this actually over in the Atlantic, there's never been a storm on the Atlantic Ocean, even though there's been lots of big waves there. There's never been a storm on the Atlantic Ocean that's washed over the bridge of a battleship whose roots were any more than on the surface. Here's how I know. Because the submarine goes down 50 feet, and it's as calm as a pond on a June day. The storm always comes on the surface. That's why the submarine says, dive deeper. Joy is the deepness of the knowing, the righteousness, and the peace you have with God. In London, the Buckingham Palace, at least until not long ago, Buckingham Palace will fly the royal standard to show that royalty is actually in residence. Day or night, the flag can be seen. The people know that their queen is not away, but she is at home. So joy flies as the flag, if you will, over our lives to show that Christ, the king, is in residence of our hearts. And at the crowning of Solomon, 1 Kings 1.40, it says, All the people went up after him, playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy, so that the earth was split by the noise. I was telling somebody the other day about Dwayne and Face. We were talking last night, actually, about Dwayne and Face 50th. That was a surprise till yesterday, right? Okay, you're good. They were the first couple to get married right here in this sanctuary, right here, 50 years ago, December 22nd. Amen. Amen. 
and Dwayne has turned gray and face just as dark head as she was the day she got married. Man, we appreciate that so much. You've been tough on Dwayne, haven't you? <laughs> oh, thumbs up over there. You remember this, Martha and Marty? It was the, I think it was around December 9th, 1973. It was 13 days before you stood here and got married. Bonnie and Clarence were there. There's a couple, a few more of you, and it's still in the room. Started over what's now Hudson Funeral Home and marched down the road, came up the street, came into here, and I think you guys sang a little song on the platform 50 years ago, and that was the first service in this new church, in this new building. That was in 1973, 50 years ago, December. We didn't have a golden celebration, but someday we'll celebrate really in the golden arches of heaven. Amen. But Nehemiah 8.10 this day is holy to the Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Psalm 1611 again, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Psalm 3211. I will go to God, to God my exceeding joy. Psalm 43, 4. When Christ was born, the angel said, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you great tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, all people. For to you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, Stephen. And when we turn to the legacy which Christ left to his people, we read, Peace I leave with you, peace I give to you, not as the world gives, but let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Amen? These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be full. John 16, so you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one, no one will take your joy from you. In Romans 14, 17, I want to wrap this up as our musicians get ready to come back. In the King James Version, they use the word thus. T-H-U-S, okay? He who serves Christ in these things, okay? You could say he who serves Christ in this manner, in this manner. The believer who serves Christ, as indicated here, is acceptable to God and approved by men, all right? There is to be no taint of legalism in the believer's attitudes. He or she is to live in righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, quote, the Holy Spirit. Such a manner of living will be well-pleasing to God, and it must gain the approval of men, okay? In this study, we shall develop these three thoughts, amen, hallelujah, the believer's manner of life, the acceptance by God, the approval of his life by men. The Bible everywhere indicates that God doesn't want a man or woman to be content with a set of moral standards. If that was enough, then the Ten Commandments was all you needed. Jesus wasted his time coming, but how many know that didn't work? You can live your life legalistically. I mean, we have laws out the cranium in this land. But it's amazing how many jails are full. My nephew works for the jail. He said there's 100 or 120 down there. It's full house. Wait, my thought we had laws. Why isn't everybody obeying the laws? Can you tell me? I'm asking, I'm asking, can you tell me? Can anybody in the room tell me why? Oh, wait a minute, who said that? Say that word again. Their what? Their hearts. You can do what you want to do, say what you want to say, but you know how God will judge you? What's in your heart? You can fool me, you can fool your wife, your husband, your kids. You can fool the president. I won't even go there. Sorry, I shouldn't use that one. Listen, I, I only think in there, Martha, I'm sorry. Listen, matter of office, matter of office there. But God knows your heart. You can say, oh, well, I don't believe. Who, who was to tell me this morning, said somebody, uh, who was it, talking about atheist? I said, well, God doesn't believe in atheism. So, because I read Romans chapter 1, you know what it tells me there? All men, A-L-L, that means from Adam to the last one born on the planet, all men were without excuse. So, brother, sister, 
You don't have to use that with me or anybody else. You will. Bar none, you will stand before the one you denied. And he will read off your future. Don't go there. It's a story of a woman. And she was, she was shamed and brought closer to God by someone in the world that normally we kind of overlook. Let me read you this story real quick before we go to our baptism. And many of you in the room, you've been in this position before. She says, we're the only family with children in the restaurant. She has a little boy named Eric. I sat Eric in a high chair and noticed everyone was quietly eating and talking. Suddenly, Eric squeals with glee and said, hi there. He wiggles and he giggles with joy at a man with a tattered rag of a coat, dirty, greasy, and worn. His pants are baggy, about to fall of him. The zipper at half mast. His toes are poking out of his would-be shoes. His shirt was filthy. His hair was uncombed, unwashed. His whiskers weren't quite a beard, and varicose charted a complex map across his nose. We were too far to smell him, but I'm sure he smelled. His hands waved at my baby. Hi there, baby. Hi there, big boy. I see you, Buster, the man said to Eric. My husband and I didn't know what to do. Eric continued to laugh and answer, Hi, hi there. Our meal finally came, and the drunken geezer began shouting across the room, Do you know Patty Cake? Do you know Peekaboo? Hey, look, he knows Peekaboo. Now, how many are kind of like cowering in their seat in the middle of Chick-fil-A here? 400 people in there. No one thought the old man was cute. My husband and I are embarrassed. But Eric, on the other hand, was running through his repertoire of tricks, all of which were admired by this bum. We finally get through the meal. My husband went to pay. Eric and I are headed for the door, and the old man's poised between me and the door. She said, I uttered a prayer. Lord, just let me get out of here before he speaks to me or Eric. Anybody ever prayed that prayer before? As I drew close the man, I turned my back trying to sidestep him and void any air he might be breathing. Can you say COVID? As I did, Eric leaned over my arm, reached with both arms in a baby's pick-me-up position. Before I could stop him, Eric had propelled himself from my arms to this man's. Eric, in an act of total trust, get this, Love and submission laid his little head upon the man's ragged shoulder. The man's eyes closed. He said, I saw tears hover beneath his lashes. His aged hands, full of grace, beheld and hugged my child and wept. Isn't that what Christ did for you? I was that man. And he comes down like a child and he embraces me. Now you can say what you want, but that's what Christ does to each and every one of us. You either accept or you reject. 